This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the Hero Academy Podcast. I created this podcast for you if you are a first responder, police officer, fireman, nurse, military personnel. This podcast is for you. Let's get your stories out. They need to be heard by everyone, especially the good ones. Let's share those stories and create some positivity out there in the world. Enjoy this episode. Hi, right, fam. I'm going to put you on to the absolute most simplest way to start your podcast today or this week. The app is called Anchor. Number one, it's free. Number two, they have a really intuitive creation tool that allows you to record and edit right from your cell phone or laptop. Anchor will distribute it out to all the major podcast players like Apple, Spotify, and many more. It's really everything you need to get started in one simple app. P.S. I recommend starting this week instead of letting months go by like I did. You can start to earn money right from your podcast right away with no minimum audience, no minimum listenership. The service is free and the app is free. And let me repeat this so you really get it. They have everything you need to get going ridiculously fast. You can use your cell phone in your pocket to make bank. You can create, distribute, and monetize your podcast right from your celly. Download the Anchor app today after this podcast. That's A-N-C-H-O-R. Or on your computer, the website is anchor.fm. All right, welcome back to the Hero Academy podcast. On today's episode, we have Larry Forletta. Larry, thank you for your patience. We had a little bit of trouble this morning, you know, but uh, <laughs> we're going to get this interview. We're going to get it going. If you don't mind just telling the audience a three to five minute version story of your life. Okay, Dave. Well, hey, it's been great. It's very interesting to have two cops and one trying to record this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's too funny. Well, anyways, uh, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, about 40, 50 miles north of Pittsburgh. I was uh, maybe one of two to go to college. Uh, you know, most of my family were immigrants from Italy and great neighborhood. I miss it every day because that was such, uh, I mean, the people, you can't replace them. They're, you know, it's just the way to, you know, you talk about neighborhoods and everybody looked out after each other and it was a well integrated neighborhood. I'll say that. So we had people from other ethnicities and colors and et cetera. And, and I'll tell you, it, it was just, when I think about it, it uh, still gives me the chills to this day. Was uh, this but, the uh, 60s, 70s? Yeah, well, it was actually, yeah, the 50s and 60s. And, you know, mostly I grew up in the 60s. Okay. You know, as a teenager and, and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, everybody pretty much knew everybody. You know, everybody knew everybody's family, their grandparents, you know, you could go into grocery stores and say, hey, you know, I'll tell your grandfather tomorrow, just take the candy, whatever. And uh, it was beautiful. You know, it's all I can say. And from there, you know, I worked a few jobs after graduating from high school. And I decided that working in a steel mill wasn't for me, just like all my uh, family has had done. So I went to college. I got a bachelor's degree in, in law enforcement administration. I was working some part-time jobs, going to college, working in security and different things like that. And then uh, after I got out, I started with a small police department, a local police department. And I was there for a few months. And then I went to the Maryland State Police. And I was with the Maryland State Police for almost eight years. I started working in narcotics. Uh, I got that bug working undercover. And, you know, I never looked back because then uh, I knew where I wanted to go. And so uh, that's why I ended up going over to DEA. And it was a great career move for me. Uh, I have no regrets. I made a lot of great friends. You know, a lot of challenging and interesting things happened. And, you know, I've been retired now, going on my 17th year. God bless, man. That's it, awesome. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's like yesterday, you know, still think about it. You know, we still uh, have some really close friends because I worked in Maryland mostly. I was in, well, when I got out, I was in D.C., Baltimore, and then Pittsburgh was my last stop coming home back, basically. So, um, you know, I just wanted to have my kids around my family uh, so that they could understand a little bit of it, you know, and our family, let's say my wife's family as well. And it was a good thing for them. 
career wise, you know, I could have went into a lot of different things. It just wasn't for me. My family uh, was most important. Uh, the jobs are the job, you know, and believe me, it was uh, very challenging. Uh, we made decent money, you know, overall, you know, like I said, I had no regrets. And then after I retired, I just was looking, trying to figure out what I was going to do. When your family was young, yeah. kids were little, did your wife stay at home? Yes, she did. And so what happened was, and then she decided once they got school age, uh, she actually went to work at the school where they were. Okay. <laughs> uh, which was, you know, so she kept an eye on them <laughs> at, at both places, at home yeah. and at school. So that was a good thing for the kids as well. And uh, so it all worked out. But, in, you know, in the beginning of my career, I was on the road so much. I traveled all over the place and uh, didn't have children at that point. But again, I, you know, I've been married for 46 years now. Oh, so, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, that tells you something about my wife, too, because, <laughs> you know, putting up with me after all these years and enhancing my career, so to speak, doing my job etc but yeah so it all paid off in the end and it was it was a great thing for everybody so i'm very curious about the dea because i know you're the only dea agent that i've ever interviewed you're the first one and i've met a couple on a couple of task force before but i really don't know much about their job other than there's a lot of travel right. involved you know and i know there's a lot of undercover work also but i also know that not every agent is an undercover some are you know, yeah. working in other aspects as well. Mm -hmm. Did you work in both roles as an undercover and also as a takedown? Oh, yeah. I mean, we had guys that did some long-term undercover stuff. I didn't do that. I did short-term undercover stuff like most cops do. Yeah. Uh, and I worked, of course, undercover as a Maryland State Trooper as well. So I already had the experience working undercover, you know, buying drugs and, you know, working different level of traffickers, basically. You know, so you start at the bottom and you work your way up. So we did a lot of different things. You know, I played a role as a drug dealer. We called them reverse stings. The one thing about the federal system, uh, we had a conspiracy law, which was really great. I mean, you get caught up in a conspiracy. I kind of relate to people to explain how it works. It's almost like going and investigating a burglary. You know, yep. you take, you get the evidence and then you start interviewing witnesses, you corroborate the evidence, and then, you know, you present it to the court. And uh, there's been a lot of people that, and especially when you're dealing with the upper level of drug traffickers, you're not going to catch them selling dope. They don't do that. You know, they have other people that do all their work. So, you know, our job really at DEA is, is to go after the sources and really dismantle the organization. And when you dismantle the organization, it starts with the distributors, mid-level, transportation people, money launderers, and then the actual importers. And so there's a whole conglomerate of sophistication uh, behind that level of, of drug trafficking. My experience with that level of drug trafficking is only with television, you know, like yeah. I've only I've only seen bits and pieces. So I know that. You know, some of these guys have really big organizations. What's the most amount of money you ever seen placed on a table during a seizure? I think over a million in cash, uh, at least that I. Can what does remember. that look? What does that look like? A lot of money. <laughs> 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 Just look at a, um, you know, one of those big conference tables stacked with one hundred dollar bills, Ben Franklin's, and you can only imagine how big that is. And you know, that is really small. Peanuts to some of the bigger seizures that we've done, you know, where guys are seizing 20, 30 million in cash uh, from That's different crazy. organizations. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, so. you, you ever do anything with the uh, shipping containers? You ever find anything like uh, money or drugs in shipping containers? Because I know uh, Maryland has a lot of ports. Yeah, we got a big port. The Port of Baltimore is huge. I've actually been on the ships with customs with their dogs. And we've actually searched these containers, but we didn't find anything because if you've ever been on one of the ships, it's almost impossible to find it unless you have some really good intelligence and inside information as to where they may be stashing the dope on those big ships. And a lot of times we already know in, in some cases 
where the dope's at because yeah, we may yeah. have inf- we may have informants on the ships. There may have been wiretaps listening in, you know, hearing these guys talk, especially overseas, you know, intercepting them there. And as these containers leave their ports, like in Colombia or some other places. So we have a good idea for the most part. You know, a lot of it, it's just not luck as what we try to let people believe. It's intensive work to try to figure out where they're going, their transportation routes. So that's kind of the way it works. And we have, for example, we would know if we knew that a ship was going to be transporting a large, let's say, a large sum of cocaine. Sometimes you alert the Coast Guard without our involvement. Or you look, you know, and sometimes even with like traffic stops, we would alert police departments like your police department, Suffolk County or NYPD or the state police organizations. And we'd have them do the traffic stops, you know, as you guys develop in your own probable cause to protect our investigation, because obviously, you know, we don't want to disclose that to tip our hand to the real bad guys. So that's kind of how that that whole process works. That's pretty cool. So. In my mind, it seems like the most dangerous law enforcement job that you can take because, you know, <laughs> I've seen narcos, I've seen, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've seen, I've seen all of the Hollywood stuff, but for an undercover, it just seems like the most dangerous job that you can take. Well, one of the things about working undercover, there's really two things going against you. One, the bad guys think you're a cop or the bad guys think you're a snitch, an informant. You know, we had a DEA agent by the name of Everett Hatcher. He was killed in New York City uh, by one of the mob guys back in uh, the 90s. And they thought that Everett was an informant and surveillance was on him. They lost him and then they found Everett dead in his car. How did they get that idea in their head that he was an informant? Something, Some conversation. Like I said, as you know, the bad guys are very paranoid. Very. Yep. And so they want to make sure that, you know, they may have some questions about the guy or talking to him, or maybe they don't, it doesn't feel right to them. And, you know, this guy, he went to the extreme. He was associated with one of the mob families. He wasn't really a mob guy, but he was one of those wannabes. He was a big guy, steroid user. After he killed Everett, You know, there was a big manhunt for them and uh, DEA and the FBI and some other agencies all worked together. We put a lot of pressure on the five mob families in New York, and eventually they ended up killing the guy and they found them uh, dead in a car in in the city. They called our our office and uh, I guess took care of their problem. Wow. (laughs) So, you know, those are the kind of things that happen. And, you know, when you talk about narcos, I know uh, Steve Murphy and of your opinion. They've actually have been on my podcast. Uh, we have a podcast as well. And I interviewed them on my show. Now they have their own and really two great guys, you know, very humble. And, uh, you know, they worked the largest trafficker in the world at the time of Pablo Escobar. That is so, a crazy story. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff that you see on Netflix, yeah, there's some Hollywood hype in it. And they try to base some of it on, you know, a true story. But It's just like everything else. You know, law enforcement, probably most realistic shows are like cops because you get to see the actual events taking place. With us, it's an after effect. You know, sometimes we'll take news media out with us to see what our job entails and they can understand how dangerous it is. And something about DEA, you know, that they have offices all over the country, but we're in 70 foreign countries. You know, and so we've had different instances take place. We've had agents killed overseas and in Mexico and on and on. But uh, so, you know, when you look at the big picture, DEA agents like local police officers have one thing in common. That's to save lives. It really is, because when you look at today's world right now, there is so much fentanyl uh, coming into our country that it is so deadly. If you got a bad batch of heroin, you could send warnings out to the general public. You know, we've had overdose deaths with heroin and stuff like that, but nothing to this extreme. Because- I don't know why addicts would do. I understand they have an addiction, but I don't know why they would do something that is that deadly and like that poisonous. Yeah. 
Well, and that's what it is. It's poison because the fentanyl now is just an additive and it's put in with different, let's say, lookalike pills like Oxys or Vicodins. And these kids are taking them, you know, and, and when you look at about 90,000 to 100,000 Americans dying from overdoses every year, that's a plague to me. And that's a serious plague. So, and I think DEA's model now is one pill can kill and it doesn't take much fentanyl to kill somebody. You know, you're talking a minute amount to kill someone. What have you been doing since retirement? Well, what I did was, as I told you, I didn't really have a plan. I thought I had a plan until I retired, you know, and I felt, uh, you know, it took a, a month off or so. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to go work for myself. I have a skill set as an investigator for you know close to 30 years. And uh, I decided to go into my own investigation business. So I started, uh, God, October of 2006, and I haven't stopped working yet. That's so really cool. What kinds of things do you investigate? Or did you start investigating in the beginning? Well, I actually, you know, so what happens is you meet a lot of lawyers in your profession. And I've met some really good lawyers in some of my federal cases. And some of them found out that I had retired, contacted me and said, hey, would you interview this person? Can you find out about this? Yada, yada, yada. And then the rest is history. I kind of scrutinize the type of cases I do. But again, you know, I run a business now. So I got a, I took my law enforcement hat off about <laughs> 17 years ago, although it'll still never go away. Believe me. But when you run a business, you have to look at a lot of different options. And so I did that. So, and I, I base my business really on a law enforcement organization with offering a lot of different services like polygraph, handwriting, DNA lab. Uh, we have, a uh, what we call technical surveillance countermeasures is to pick up listening devices and all that stuff, audio. And we do that a lot with businesses and corporations because of employees that do the craziest things. They put cameras in women's restrooms. And then I've had a couple, we've had a couple of cases like that. Yeah. And you know, so, and then I, I've worked some personal family cases with a lot of money being stolen from a family member, about 400,000 in cash was stolen. We narrowed it down to a couple of suspects, but they passed on taking a polygraph. Ah. And, uh, you know, there's some other heart-wrenching cases I did. I had a missing persons case in Pittsburgh and the kid's name was Dakota James. And that happened a few years ago. And Dakota went missing in January. He was a college student. Well, he was actually a grad student at one of the local colleges. And so I got hired through a contact, through a family friend to help the family. He had been missing for, well, we finally found him. He surfaced in the water about 40 days later. Obviously, he was deceased. So that particular case actually became a docuseries called The Smiley Face Killers. And so I got featured on the Oxygen Network on that case. And I actually met some retired NYPD guys that started this profile years ago called the Smiley Face Killers. And these guys are retired NYPD homicide detectives. I never heard of the Smiley Face Killers. Can you tell me what's that about? Well, what happened was back in the late 70s, uh, the guys who were with NYPD homicide started looking at some of these cold cases, mysterious cases, and a smiley face would end up near a body. And so they developed a profile of the victims. Most of the victims were white males in their mid-20s, early 20s. Some of them were gay. Some of them were athletic. And so usually their body ended up in the water, unexplained. I was going to ask you if there was any kind of uh, homosexual connection. No, there was never that we knew of. There was no big organization out to kill gays. These were more like independent type of incidents. No arrest, to my knowledge, have ever been made. You know, and law enforcement always had issues with the theories and things of that nature. But the guys in the FBI, the guys were really good. And like I said, we did this case here and there was some suspicious things, some very unexplained incidents 
like in the case that I was involved in, we could not figure out how we got into the water. So eventually uh, the medical examiner looked at the case and then we had an independent medical examiner look at the case and the independent medical examiner gave a different version from the original death certificate. So that's where it became controversial. Mm. But uh, the guys that have done this, they've been doing it for God a long time, over 20 years at least, doing these types of cases. And the Oxygen Network did a series, I think it was a six series, and they actually started out with our case because it was the most recent one. The other cases were more historical And there was a lot of people that died in in Wisconsin. And then when you begin to look at this big picture, Wisconsin, Boston, et cetera, you know, it really, uh, really raises your eyebrows as to how this thing really happened. Uh, One of the toughest things about a serial killer is that there's no connection to their victim. So if they move around to different states, it could take you decades to realize that there's a connection. That's true. And usually if if they don't confess, you never know. And that's usually what happens with a lot of the serial killers. They eventually, some get caught because they're doing active stuff, but the ones that don't do active stuff and let things lay for a long time, you know, until they finally screw up or the police are able to get a confession out of them, that's the only way you find out. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. In your investigative business now, what's some of the challenges that you face? Like what's some of the obstacles right now? Well, you know, the biggest obstacle, I'm a private citizen now. And so we have to do, you know, obviously we got to follow rules and regulations. We can't just go breaking the law to get information, you know, and there's some people out there to do it and they end up getting caught and they go to jail, just like bad cops or bad agents or whoever. But yeah, it's definitely more challenging because you don't have the access that you once had. You do have a network of private investigators and most of them are retired law enforcement. And it's really a good community because a lot of the people like, you know, the top communicate, you know, we belong to associations, we attend conferences. So it's a really good network. And I belong to a couple of them. One is an international group. So I need anything overseas. I just go on and see who it is. And everybody's been vetted, properly vetted. And, uh, you know, we go from there. And plus, you know, after all these years, I got still a good lot of local law enforcement connections, good federal connections. So, you know, it helps, definitely helps. And I think, you know, being in law enforcement is an advantage in one sense because you do have a good network out there and you still have a lot of great connections and stuff like that. So that kind of makes things a little bit easier sometimes. Do you have any um, wild DEA stories that you can remember, like any funny ones? Yeah, I can think of a few of them. Let me hear one. I love good stories. <laughs> well, this was, uh, I was being transferred from uh, Baltimore to Pittsburgh. So it was one of my last few days at the office. And you tell the guys, don't get me, I don't want to get involved in anything, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> right. It's famous last words. So I had developed a really good relationship with one of the local police departments, Howard County Police Department. I knew all the narcotics guys. They're great guys to work with and we developed some very close personal friendships. So anyways, this was my, I don't know, three or four days before I'm getting transferred. But the way it worked out was I ended up being the senior guy out there. The supervisor was off that day. So I'm in charge. Okay. And I'm in charge out on the street. So, you know, we team up with everybody And we were going to do a buy bust that day. We had a, an informant that had a large sum of cash in his car. And so what happened was we had bought some dope from this Asian person. And now we were trying to set up for the big kill, I guess. And so it was a beautiful day. out. I'll never forget this. And I'm in a car with a Howard County detective. Then we have the police out there. We have uniformed guys hidden. We have our agents and detectives in a fast food restaurant sitting inside. So they had a direct eye on the car because in the trunk was the flash money. Okay. So we have an outer perimeter surveillance. And then we have the, you know, we tell the informant, you know, go ahead and, you know, reach out to the guy. So they 
agree to meet. And they agree to meet at this particular fast food restaurant. So as we're taking out a perimeter surveillance of the place, we see a group of guys in a car. There's probably four or five of them in one car. And, uh, you know, that started raising a red herring right there, you know. That's a red flag, red flag. Definitely. So they showed up and the informant was contacted by the other bad guy he was supposed to buy the dope from. So he says, hey, you know, meet me in the bathroom. I want to talk to you. Informant walks in. Now we have guys that have the eyes. We got the listening devices so we can hear what's going on. So he goes into the bathroom to meet this other bad guy. Lo and behold, another bad guy sneaks in the bathroom and begins to pistol whip the informant. Oh, my God. You know, this is like three o'clock in the afternoon in a nice area. And people are, are eating inside of this fast food restaurant. So you can only imagine what's going through my mind at this point. So, you know, we're trying to keep everybody calm. Don't rush in. See what happens. Because they could hear the guy being beat. So eventually they come out. And the, the informant is all bloodied. This idiot comes out. He's got a gun to his head. Takes him out, gunpoint, with a gun to his head. Right out in front. All these people are running and screaming. He goes out to the uh, car and tells the guy, open the trunk. Because he wanted the money. This was a robbery. That's what it was. These guys were professionals that set up drug dealers and robbed them. Uh. So now here we are. We got two guys, two agents and the detectives outside. They got their guns pointed at the bad guy. Here comes a uniform. Calvary comes in. Everybody's got their guns pointed at him. He will not drop his weapon. So he's got a hostage. He's got a hostage. And so the other car that had the other additional people take off. So we take off after them. Okay. And they get the first scene under control. The guy did surrender. Thank God that there was no, nothing further. So these guys stop and go in a gas station. So the friend of my partner with from Howard County police jumps out and he goes, Hey, Larry, come on, jump out, jump out. Uh, I'm going like this. I can't get out. What happened was I put my seatbelt on underneath my vest. (laughs) He was screaming at me. Hurry up. I'm trying to figure out how the hell do I get out of this damn seatbelt. Oh, my God. So so eventually I figured it out. So that was one of my most embarrassing moments. But at my going away party, they actually designed a seatbelt for me uh, as as a going away gift. So, you know, and there, there's others, but that one kind of stood out in my mind. You know, it's one of those it, days that you'll never forget no, for the rest of your life. No. Uh, the other bad guys, did they get away or were they caught? No, we caught everybody. Uh, right, the, the guy that held the gun to the informant's head just got out of the D.C. city jail for murder. Uh, just got out. Was a new parolee back to committing crime. But I interviewed the Asian guy and we debriefed him to find out what happened. He obviously cooperated. And he told us that what they did was they would sell small quantities of dope, like an ounce or whatever, to another person as a drug dealer. And that they would just, you know, tell them, hey, we got a large amount, bring the cash, et cetera. So that's all they did. They robbed each other. The bad guys robbed other bad guys. Uh, Yeah, that's a pretty common thing because they figure they're not going to be able to call the police. Yeah, they're not calling the police. You know, they're gonna say, hey, I didn't, I just lost 50 grand to some, you know, to some other bad guys. Part of the game. Um, yeah, it's all part of the game. So, you know, one other interesting thing that I had, there was another case. It's not very funny, but it is in one sense. So we had a, a major drug trafficker in Ohio. We targeted him and he had a bunch of money in his house. He had custody of his children. One night, these guys hit the house. They robbed him at gunpoint and they took one of his children, made them walk oh up God. to the, yeah, took one of his children, made him walk up to the bedroom to get the cash. So as he was doing that, the person who eventually to cooperate us, he was laying flat down on his face. And then there was another bad guy beside him. So he looked up because he could see his child walking down the steps. The other knucklehead decides to fire around as a warning about looking up. Well, he hit one of his own guys. 
So they did, they ended up taking the informant's van and took their guy to an emergency room. They left him in the damn van and he died. Oh, my God. Unbe- unbelievable. And we never never solved that. So, But the interesting thing was my hat off to the homicide detectives because they actually told the guy, look, we're not interested in you. We know you're a drug dealer. We know this was about money. And, of course, the guy admits to being a drug dealer. So they didn't care about him, but we certainly <laughs> did. So they gave us a nice videotape confession, and that's how that cold case started. So that that was a uh, you know it was a really good story. So you know I've watched a lot of <clears throat> movies on drug dealing, right? And I've thought about what it takes to be at the highest level of. I've watched a lot of American Gangster A and E specials, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the number one thing that these guys, you know, the bad guys, that they don't realize is they think they can control. There's so many external factors that they can't control. Right. That's exactly you, right. They can't control when someone ODs. They can't right. control when one of their lower level guys gets into a domestic fight with his lady, and his lady says. I know all his secrets. Yep. And then she goes and tells you all his secrets. You know, you never mess with a scorned woman. Oh, there's no <laughs> doubt about that one. Uh, I've met a lot the, of them. Uh, <laughs> you ever see the Chris Rock, the little skit where she goes, he got weed in the car, he got weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like a woman scorn. And I can tell you, you know, we arrested a lot of the couriers. They were some of my best witnesses in federal court. Women have such a great memory for detail. Uh And believe me, you know, I got them sitting across the table from me, you know, the defendant, and he's just shaking his head like (laughs) he knew he was done. Yep, yep. So I think there's a lot more women getting into the drug game, too. Oh, yeah. When I was a street cop, I noticed an uptick in a lot more women selling pills, selling heroin. One of my biggest stops, I had a uh, girl who was a user slash dealer. Right. She's riding with a guy who I knew they just, they didn't fit. Like mm-hmm. I asked her, I got her to the back of the car and I was like, is that your boyfriend? And she's like, no. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, and I was like, okay, I know there's drugs in the car. Let me know where they are. And I promise you, you'll just get a summons. You know, you'll just get a ticket, no seatbelt. You'll be on your way. I'm like, I know there's drugs in the car. I know he's a dealer. But the only way I'm going to find it, and I said, if I find it, both of you go in because he's not going to take possession of it, you know? Sure, yeah. But she told me right away. She's like, oh, it's in the bottom of the uh, Coke bottle. You know, you just twist off the bottle. And there, yeah. was a lot of, there was a lot in there, and I would never would have known. Oh, no. I mean, and that's the interesting thing. I mean, and the thing about drug trafficking, and what a lot of people don't understand, it crosses every ethnic and racial barrier. There isn't any one group that doesn't sell dope. They There's all do. so much money involved. Yeah. And so I could tell you, I have arrested people from so many, not only here in the United States, different foreign countries. And I'm saying, you know, one thing about DEA, we're really a melting pot of our society because everybody comes from a different background. So, you know, we have Asian agents. Black agents, this agent, Hispanic, et cetera, et cetera. And that's because really, you need that. You need that. Because you have to fit in and you have to be able to, you know, to work in with those different groups. So that's one good thing that I was involved with because, you know, when I first went into DEA and I'd get my graduate and so on, you know, I, I went into an office in DC and there was four women in my group. I'm like, wow. You know, because in the state police, we we're lucky we had a couple women working narcotics, you know, and then all my bosses, you know, supervisors, every different ethnic group there was. So, I mean, that's, I think, made the agency what it is today because of the people with a variety of backgrounds. Another thing that I find fascinating about the DEA that a lot of people don't know, when they do these overseas operations, they have some some tactical units that are basically, they're like Navy SEALs. Yes. That's true. Like these guys are special forces yeah. agents. Well, we had a group called FAST. Okay. They were foreign ad- advisory groups. Okay. They were actually cross trained with the military 
special forces and Navy SEALs. And what comes to mind is Afghanistan because they worked hand in hand with the military destroying a variety of poppy fields. I'll give you a guy's name. His name is Joe Persante. If you ever want somebody on your podcast, this guy's amazing. If you can link us up, I'd appreciate it. I would definitely do that. Joe, in his group, he was like one of the older guys, but he was a former Detroit cop, came on a job and got into the special operations group. Now, we had a we had one group way back when, when I was there, called Snowcap, and all they did was destroy cocaine labs, same yeah. type of training. So what they did with this group is they focused on Afghanistan. And so, again, they trained with special forces, Navy SEALs, and then they deployed in teams. So Joe was assigned to a team, and he was working with a Australian group. Now, those guys were in firefights every day, just like the oh military. Oh, my God. Oh, just, my God. <laughs> just like the military, firefights every day. So it just happened in this one occasion. Joe was with the, uh, working with the Australian Special Forces. They hit a village, and Joe got hit by a sniper. And the bullet went through his helmet, and it blew out the front part of his forehead. Oh, my God. Yes. And, he, of course, he almost died there, but he was able to get in the helicopter. They saved his life, and eventually they took him to Walter Reed Hospital where they performed surgery on him, and uh, he went blind. But at the end of the day, he survived. So he finished his career with DEA. He was blind. He mostly worked like intelligence and stuff like that. And when you hear this guy talk, it'll send chills through your body because of what he had to overcome. And uh, which is why I do my podcast is to educate the public of what some DEA people do. And I had no so, idea. I had no idea all the different branches that are within yeah. the DEA. You know, no, most yeah. people don't. Most people don't. Yeah. And so I finally, just this past year, I got to meet Joe in person. He's actually a bodybuilder. This guy's like 51, 52. He won his division. It's amazing. You know, when you see this guy coming out on stage and he's blind and, you know, it really gets the audience attention. And it was really a great thing. So he just turned as a professional bodybuilder. And the guy has an amazing story. But um, That is an amazing story. And, and there's so many different things that we do, you know, not just. You see chasing cars by busting people. There's special operations. You know, we had uh, what they call the special operation division. And that consisted of, oh, I'm trying to think, 30, 40 different agencies. And we were doing wiretaps literally all over the world. I was just going to say, you guys probably work closely with the CIA. Yes. Overseas, we work closely with the CIA and some of the State Department people. There, and there's always been some issues, controversy as you probably know, uh, between us and the CIA, because we had different, you know, different agendas, definitely different agendas. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. So, you know, we were always after the bad guys. They worked a little different with them because they had to worry about the governments and stuff like that. But yep. the one good thing is we created a intelligence network. It's probably the best in the world because we could get information that a lot of these other agencies could not get because of our relationship there, because, hey, we're helping the host country try to solve their problems with drugs. And so they looked at us, I would say, a lot different than the other agencies that came overseas. Yeah, that's really, that's wild, man. That's really cool. What's something that only a small circle of your friends know about you? Oh, wow. That I was an altar boy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know that now that I That's... made it public. <laughs> <laughs> and what's three pieces of advice that you'd give your 18-year-old uh, self if you were talking to that kid? Well, you know, make sure that you hang around with good people, never negative people, because they'll bring you down to be negative. Keep your wits about you as best as you can. You know, know your surroundings and who you're dealing with and trust God. To me, that's very important. When I look back at some of the situations that I've been in, I know that, you know, we had the uh, St. Michael the Angel on my shoulders because I almost got shot and killed in a raid. Uh, it was very close. And fortunately, it didn't happen the way that it could have happened. 
And uh, so I count my blessings every day. Because I think uh, even with most kids, one of the things that kind of gave me some discipline was my faith and my growing up as a Catholic, being taught by the nuns and, and all this. That to me was my first road of self-discipline. But, you know, as you get to become a teenager, you get a little goofy, yep. uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, the world looks maybe a little different. But, you know, now that I'm a senior citizen, I still look at the world a lot different than I did when I was 18 years old. So, I mean, that's kind of the way I, I look at things. And, you know, and the one thing that I learned, and this applies to law enforcement, treat people the way you want to be treated. If you treat people with respect, you're going to get it back. You know, you don't just say, you got to respect me because I'm a cop. That doesn't work that way. When you work out in the community, because I know I had a uniform on, you work out in the community and you treat people with respect, regardless of their income and what neighborhood you're in, you're going to get it back. 100%. I, you know, I saw that because I, you know, even when I was in, uh, in Baltimore and I was working narcotics as a state trooper. I That's worked, a rough area, man. That is a rough, rough area. Yeah, I worked in West Baltimore, one of the most dangerous areas around. And, you know, we'd go into, you know, like if we're taking a break, we'd go into a barbecue place. Lee, I, I'll still not forget this. It was called Leon's Pig Pen, okay? And, you know, let's face it. The only white people in there, they're either drug addicts or cops. That's or cops, it. yep, yep. And so the guy that was working there, so we ordered some barbecue sandwiches because they had the best barbecue and ribs in town. So we're in there, and, and the guy says, hey, you guys, he said, uh, you were either the man or the vending man. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't see no machines on your back. So that, to me, you know, they knew. You know. Yeah, yeah. But... You know, we had a good relationship because we'd go there all the time and eat. You know, we got to know the the guys that ran the business. And it was, a, again, it's about how you treat people. And if you understand that, because, you know, a lot of cops, a lot of them do come from a working class neighborhood, but some don't. And, you know, when you go on a federal level, it's even different because, you know, you get college educated and some of them have never gotten their fingernails dirty before in their life. You know what I'm talking about. Right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and that's the same thing because you can't go in to a police department and say, hey, I'm a fed. Give me all your information and I'll get back to you. You know what I'm saying, right? Some people do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some agencies do. Yep. And that's where I've learned when we did investigations, the unique thing about DEA, we didn't go in with these secrets. We went into work with the detectives or the narcotics guys saying, hey, listen, how can we work together? How can we help each other? And I, you know, we brought guys right in. They worked, like I said, Howard County Police, side by side, took trips with me. We deputized them as a federal agent. And that to me is, it develops great working relationships. It sounds like fun. I wish that I could have done a little bit of undercover in my career. I'm near, like I told you before, I'm nearing the end of it. So yeah. it's likely... And I've put myself all over the internet now, so it's likely never going to happen. But uh, that's one small regret that I wish I, I could have done when I was a little bit younger or even towards the tail end of my career. If I could have just did it for like a year or two, yeah. I think UC work is, you know, it, it's sexy. You know, it's, it's fun. Yeah, well, you know, when I went in to work narcotics for the state police, I got the bug. And I said to myself, I'm never putting a uniform back on. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, and some of the things you get to do, you know, are pretty good. Yeah. My last two, three questions for you. What's your best ability today? My best ability? Yep. What's your power? I think communication is one of my powers and knowing how to get my message across and know how to work with people. I think that's a big message. You know, in that missing persons case, I had a good relationship with guys on the Pittsburgh Police Department. And I was able to pick up the phone and call them and, you know, we could talk. And there's always issues when you're dealing with families and, you know, the families are under a lot of stress. You've been following that uh, Gabby Petito, Brian Lundry case? I mean, how could you yeah. not, right? It was all across the whole, yeah. The whole yeah, country. I mean, yeah, and so, I mean, you, you look at those situations like that and I'm a father. And I look at my daughter and I would, you know, I'm like, how did this guy even make it to his house? Because 
So I said, I said to my girlfriend, I'm like, you need a small black ski mask task force to go down and do a Batman type abduction. Mm-hmm. And then days later, he went missing. <laughs> but, you know, he didn't get abducted, obviously. He, he left on his own volition. But I said before he went missing, before they reported him missing, I said that's what either her stepdad or the dad needed. You needed, like, you know, a black ski mask abduction style, you know, some waterboarding. Yeah. I, it's a <laughs> some, hey, some convincing. Some convincing just for a little bit of information, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing, too. You know, I always worry about my daughter. She's a traveling emergency room nurse. Mm. She goes all over the place. And you Tell know, her I said thank you for her service. Thanks. And I know your family has a nurse in there, too. So, yeah. But, you know, when you look at things like that and people have a different perspective of things, there isn't too many things that I won't do for my children. And if I have to go one way to solve a problem, <laughs> it's, it's going to happen. It's going to go to, and you got enough connections, enough people, enough brothers yeah. that you can call on and say, Hey, we got a problem over here, you know? Exactly. And, and know? that's, and that's the great thing about law enforcement. You do have a lot of brothers and sisters. It is such a big family out there. Such a big family. And people don't understand the power of, of law enforcement when it comes to those type of situations. If you had a superpower, a comic superpower, what would it be? Comic superpower. Oh, man. I'd like to be Superman. Superman. <laughs> she was my last guest that I spoke to, she's like, I want to fly. I'm like, everybody wants to fly. Yeah. So I want all of the mental capabilities, like pyrokinesis, telekinesis, so that I can make myself fly. But I want all, you know, mind reading. I want all of those abilities, like uh, Professor X and you know, the X-Men, but I, I do want to be able to fly also. Everybody wants to be Superman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> All right. And my, and my last question for you, if my audience wants to find you, find your podcast, where should they go? Well, my website is uh, www.fcisllc.com. Uh, my podcast is called Forletta Investigates. We just finished our first year We'll be starting our second year coming up here soon. (laughs) And, you know, I tell people, go to our podcast and listen, because we've had some really great guests on there. Like I was telling you, the guys that did Pablo Escobar, I actually had a, an individual who became an informant, but was one of the main transportation guys for the Cali and Medellin cartels. Wow. And the the Mexican traffickers as well. You listen to some of these people that, this guy was brilliant. Just I wanted to uh, I wanted to share. You had brought up the Colombians before. When I was dating my wife, she had a girlfriend who was Colombian, and her father was rumored to work for the cartels. They lived in a very expensive, large home on Long Island, on the North Shore, uh, in a very nice area, upscale area, mm-hmm. and. He worked as a taxi driver. (laughs) And it was like, and I don't think the wife worked either. So it was like, not knowing much, this is before I was even in law enforcement. I was like, how does he afford that house working as a taxi driver? And I'm like, the rumors have to be true. (laughs) I think eventually he did get busted, you know? Well, you know, what usually happens though, a lot of the traffickers are a lot more sophisticated than that. Because they project themselves in a different way. Um, right. Running a legitimate business. Right. Uh, so to speak. Just like the mafia did in New York, the mob guys, they infiltrated legitimate businesses to make it look like they're legitimate. Because Yeah, you have end, to watch the money. At the end of the day, it's all about the money, right? Yeah. And that's one of the things that we did. We followed the money. Believe that or not, you know, most people think, wow, we're looking at the drugs. No, we're looking at the revenue. Where is that money going? Because that's the trail. Last question. Have you watched the Ozarks on Netflix? Don't even know what it is. Oh, my God. You would love it. Jason Bateman, he is phenomenal. He is an accountant for a drug cartel. Okay. And they basically forced him to move like 10 times the amount of money. And so he moves to the Ozarks. Oh, I saw it now. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I did see that now, now that you mentioned that. Yeah. So it's, it's really, really good. 
I wonder how many people there are in the U.S. that are doing things like that, you know? I'm sure there's quite a few of them. Larry, I really appreciate your time. It's been a fun interview. You know, I can't say enough good things about you and your career. And like I said, you were the first DEA agent that I had on the show. And you won't be the last. And I really enjoyed talking with you. Like I said, there's so many aspects to the DEA that people don't even realize. The, That's you know, yeah. like, like you said, the international aspects alone, right. um, there's so much to it. There's yeah. just so much to it. Like we could probably do an episode just talking about that, you know? Yeah. Well, just about cases alone. But uh, Dave, listen, I appreciate it. And thank you for your service. I know you, you know, 24 years and uh, stay safe, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm almost, I'm almost out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, lay low. Like I tried. Lay low. That's the plan. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very All much, right, Larry. Bro. All right. We'll see you, man. Yeah. Thanks. We'll talk soon. All right. All right, family. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Everyone I interview, I've chosen for you guys because of this story. And I hope that you get some value every single time. If you did get value or just just simply enjoyed the episode, please share the episode with someone that you know. If you know of a guest, a frontline hero that has an amazing story, something uplifting or a positive message, hit me up in the contact form of www.davidleith.com or DM me at Instagram at davidleith, the number one. Subscribe to the show because I have some really phenomenal guests coming up in the next few weeks that you definitely don't want to miss. All right, one.